Hello and welcome to the podcast, 10 Lessons That Took Me 50 Years to Learn, where we dispense wisdom for a career in life. That's wisdom for your career and your life. My name is Duff Watkins and I'm your host. Our guest today is Dr. Rosalie Lopez, who is a planetary scientist working for NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Welcome to the show, Rosalie. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Let me say to our listeners that you were born in Rio de Janeiro, educated in London. You, you now work, live in California, and uh, right. you're the author of eight books, 135 scientific articles, and you have the world's Guinness record for most volcanoes discovered. And if that's not cruel enough, you have a an asteroid named after you, which I think is pretty pretty neat. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my first question. You you grew up in Rio de Janeiro and somehow got hooked on very early to astronomy. Uh, obviously, you speak Portuguese coming from Brazil. You went to the UK, London, to study, and then somebody took you to see an active volcano. And you sort of switched from studying astronomy to being a volcanologist. So what happened? Well, what happened was that I, in my third year, which the final year in London of the astronomy course, university course, I chose a course in planetary geology. And I chose it because I had heard that the professor was really, really good. And uh, I really liked that course. And when I was studying for the exams, I thought this is what I want to do. So I switched from being interested in kind of extra galactic astronomy and solar astronomy, and I decided to study planetary geology. And he uh, said, well, you're my first student who doesn't have a degree in geology, but I think you can do something. At the end of my first year as a graduate student, uh, he took me to Mount Etna in Sicily as a helper with fieldwork, and Mount Etna erupted, and I really fell in love with volcanoes then. I have been to an active volcano once, and that will do me. That was that was sufficient. I, I think there are two people in the world, Rosalie. There are people who, when an, a volcano erupts, there are people like you who run to it, and there are people like me who run from it. So, <laughs> well, it depends on the type of eruption because there are different types of volcanoes, and some are very dangerous, and I wouldn't run towards those. Uh, it, the some are not so dangerous. So it, um, the, uh, I was in Iceland in July and, uh, really enjoyed, uh, seeing that eruption and that's not a particularly dangerous one. Well, let's talk about the 10 lessons that took you 50 years to learn. The first thing that I noticed in your career, and you have won so many awards and accolades, I simply don't have time to record them all, but two things I noticed very conspicuous. One, you're a female, two, you're a foreigner. And you've kind of made it in what I thought was a pretty male dominated world. So I, I think in some ways, what we're going to talk about is how a female scientist makes it succeeds big time in male dominated professions. So with that, which, first of all, would you say that's an accurate summary? Yes, but I never really focused on the fact that I was female. A science is something I wanted to do and specifically planetary science, planetary geology is something I fell in love with. And I think it's, um, it, it's really about what you want to do. And if you're passionate about your career, uh, you go ahead and do it. And I got used to being the only woman in the room. These days is very different. There are a lot more women in science. So mm -hmm. the young women coming into the field, uh, don't, uh, have the same experiences that I did, but I always felt that the men accepted me because I was serious and passionate about the subject. Well, clearly it's worked. So let's go to lesson number one. Hang out with people who are brighter than you. Now, I got to ask you, Rosalie, how am I going to do that? How am I going to find somebody brighter than me? <laughs> well, my father used to say that to me. That's some advice from my father. And he said that you should always be learning. Uh, you know, and no matter how bright you are, there is always going to be somebody uh, who is brighter, who knows more about particular subjects than you, you know? So it, it, it is about, you know, stretching yourself and, uh, and learning from other people. And instead of, you know, feeling that you want to be the smartest person in the room, 
Uh, in fact, you should try to be in a room with people who are smarter than you, because then you learn from them. I am of course joking about being the smartest. I, I married somebody smarter than me. My wife is Brazilian. And so we just <laughs> matter of oh, right. I have to tell you this true story we're watching. I'm, I'm sitting here in Brazil at the moment, probably about six hours from, uh, Ipanema where you were raised and, uh, we were watching global news one night and I, they were interviewing you and my wife says. You should interview her for the podcast. And I said, I think you're right. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> well, what you're saying though, actually it seems to me it takes a bit of courage because people invest so much in wanting to be the smartest person in the room. So when you're hanging around with people who are brighter than you, it takes a bit of self-awareness, a bit of courage to admit that, well, perhaps maybe you don't know everything about your particular subject. But nobody knows everything uh, about even their subject. So you might be the smartest, the smartest person or the person who knows more about a certain aspect of your subject. Uh, but, um, in my career, I always worked in teams and I worked in teams with people who knew much more about certain aspects of the work that are things I really needed. For example, if we're putting a, 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 a space mission together. We need people from many, uh, different specialties. We need engineers. We need scientists. We need scientists who know about different, uh, aspects of, of the problem. Uh, and so I think the idea is, yes, is hang out with smart people. <laughs> because you'll learn something. Lesson number two, focus on your strong points. We can't be good at everything. Yes, that's, uh, and it's partly something that I was saying before, I couldn't put a space mission together by myself. Absolutely not. Uh, and even in a research project, I, uh, that's very much in my, uh, expertise. I benefit from collaborators who know other aspects of the science better than I do. So teamwork has always been very important to me, you know, and I may have in some cases, the initial idea. Uh, you know, be the driving force, uh, but I collaborate with, uh, with other people and, and uh, you know, in some cases I go and, uh, help other people and be on their teams and everyone benefits from that. How did you discover your strong points in your career? I think it's experience and, uh, and sometimes you start discovering them even before you get to university. For example, I always liked to write and when I was in school in Brazil, I wrote in Portuguese, uh, and just for fun, it's been a bit of a hobby. And I found out that some of my colleagues uh, really don't like to write and they are not very good writers. Uh, so that's one of my strong points, you know, in the other hand, I, I found out, for example, that I, I, you know, I completely hate writing, uh, software, but many of my colleagues actually would rather write software than anything else, you know, so you team up, uh, you team up and you draw on each other's strengths and likes because, um, you got to like the work you're doing. And this is where I point out that you won, you were awarded the Carl Sagan medal. Now, when I was a kid growing up, Carl Sagan was, a um, and that's why he's a scientist, astronomer, as I recall, he was the one who popularized science on TV. When I was a kid growing up in the U S the Carl Sagan medal is given to people like you who are popularizers uh, of science, articulators of science, who present science, dim it down a few shades for people like me, so we can understand and uh, your ability to do that in writing verbally and not your native language either is quite commendable. So, uh, I wanted to mention that to our audience. Thank you. I have always enjoyed doing public outreach. So that's another of my strengths. <laughs> Which takes us to point number three, don't try to please everybody, but understand what your bosses want. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you should always understand in a job what's expected of you. Sometimes you have a lot of competing forces, let's say, uh, you know, for example, during times when I was working on a flight project and it was supposed to be a certain percentage of my time, but, um, you know, people try to suck you in for a hundred percent or more if you let them. In the other hand, I knew that what, 
you know, my boss would value when he came to promotions or raises was also my publications and how much independent research I was doing. So I had to play this game of kind of, you know, pushing back uh, on some people who I also worked for, uh, uh, so that I would balance, but understanding, you know, how I would be assessed in my work was very important. And I think it's important for everyone, uh, to understand, uh, what your boss expects of you. It is so absolutely crucial. And I think you articulated quite well. What I'm hearing is how similar the world of science is to the world of uh, business and, and corporations. Yeah. Understanding oh, yeah. who your boss is, what your boss yeah, wants. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, people come in and they want you to do other things and it takes a lot of your time. And uh, sometimes you've got to say no. Uh, and that can be very hard. I'm, I'm still learning to say no. <laughs> Well, clearly you want to be a helpful person and, uh, yeah, sometimes it does work against you. Well, and let's go, this goes to point number four, share credit for good ideas and work. The first thing I want to say, I read some research recently that said one of, I don't know if it's the number one problem, number one complaint at work, but it's very high up there. People who hog credit, take credit for work that is not their own, uh, that they didn't really own or drive or, or, but they just happen to accept the credit. So your point is very good. Share it. Yes. And a lot of success comes from teamwork and, and certainly in my job, I have relied a lot on teamwork. Uh, and sometimes I was a driving force and yes, you know, people will, uh, give me the, the awards or, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> mentioned me in the Guinness book of records, which was <laughs> quite funny. Uh, but in fact, it was all about teamwork and, uh, I may have been the one who did those detections of active volcanoes on Jupiter's moon Io, but you know, that to be able to do those detections, it relied on the work of a lot of people, you know, people who uh, built the instrument, people who flew the mission. So. As much as possible, uh, you know, share credit, uh, and, um, and give credit to other people for their good ideas. And these missions that you're talking about, I want listeners to understand, we're talking about interplanetary missions, you know, going to different planets and, and looking for volcanoes, not here, but there out there on Jupiter or Pluto or whatever your, whatever your particular mission is. And yeah, that that's such a good point, which takes me to point number five and listeners. If you want to remember anything from this podcast, this next one is to me the most crucial point. Number five, know how things get done in your organization. Yes, that is very important. And, uh, you know, it, it's very important to know how to deal with the bureaucracy, uh, know who can help you. I mean, we have a uh, remarkable, uh, you know, administrative, uh, assistance and personnel, uh, because, um, you don't want to have to spend a lot of time on things that, um, are not your expertise, but still need to be done. And also so much comes from, um, knowing people and being friendly with people uh, so that you can call someone on the phone and say, I'm not really sure where I'll go. Uh, you know, uh, to do this, or I need an expert on, um, let's say spacecraft navigation on my team, uh, or whatever it is, but, um, you need to know, uh, particularly in a large organization, uh, you know, how to find experts and how people, uh, can help you from the lowest to the highest. It's really important to try to understand your organization and understand the priorities of your organization. It, it's kind of like understanding also what your boss expects of you, but at a higher level, what your organization expects of you and how your organization works, you know, even, um, at the lowest levels. It's the how in the sentence I think is most important, but do you think it, it makes it from what you're saying? It sounds like it's uh, largely, it's the personal touch. It's cultivating relationships. In fact, this takes us to the next lesson. Number six, cultivate friends at work and in your field. 
Yes, a lot of uh, what we do that is successful uh, comes from, uh, you know, chatting with people you are comfortable chatting with. Ideas for projects, you know, ideas for uh, science missions, ideas for science projects. And mostly, um, a lot of the time, uh, people like to work with people they like and will gravitate towards those people first. And, uh, you know, if I'm having an idea, you know, for a, you know, let, let's, let's say it's a, it's a mission to Jupiter's volcanic moon Isle, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to call my budgie and say, look, you know, I have these ideas, but what do you think? You know, and then we bring in somebody else and we you know we trash these ideas around. So you can't isolate yourself. Except, you know, I mean, maybe there are a few professions where you can really work by yourself, but I think in a lot of professions, uh, it's really teamwork and uh, cultivating relationships is very important. Well, the saying in business is that there's no I, it's we. And what you're saying reminds me of something in the military. I was addressing a U.S. military war college in Sydney, Australia one time, and I was asking them, what is a war college? And it, and it's just what you said, Rosalie, they have these, uh, people from different branches, Air Force, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and they go there and they study together. And the whole idea is I've got this problem. So I call, I pick up the phone and I call Rosalie and I say, Rosalie, remember, remember that time we were studying in war college and well, you're in the Air Force and I'm not in the U.S. Marines and I've got this problem. So maybe you can help me out with it. And you say, sure enough. And it goes on like that. Even at the highest levels, it's so that national uh, touch is so important. Yes. And for negotiations of all kinds as well, it are easier to negotiate with uh, people you have a personal relationship with. There's a famous book in business, what they didn't teach me at the Harvard business school. And the author said he went to Japan to do business time and time again. And every time he went, they wanted to have these Japanese stupid Japanese tea ceremonies over and over. And he was you know, in America, come on, let's get to it. You know, time's right. And he said, after a while, a long while it took him, he finally realized they're trying to get to like me so we can do business because until they know me and like me, it's too damn hard. Yes. And actually my PhD advisor taught me that, that, um, we would want to collaborate with someone and, uh, and we would be, let's say at a a conference and uh, so he would arrange for us to go out to dinner and I was all ready to talk about the particular science project. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, that would come at the end of the dinner. We would talk about all kinds of other things and, uh, <laughs> you know, again, in young people that can be this impatience, it's like, I'm here to do business. Uh, but no, the, the building of the relationship of the trust is very important. Well, as you know, in Brazil, they're very, very warm people. My wife, who is a Brazilian, she thinks I was raised by wolves because I just want to, you know, time is running out. Let's, let's just get to business. Let's get to the point. She says, Listen, we, we don't do that. We don't operate that way here, <laughs> but, which I had like you, I have learned. <laughs> it takes us to lesson number seven, take the initiative to propose worthwhile actions in your organization. Yes. And that also comes from understanding how your organization works. Uh, but if you see something that you don't think is right or could be done more efficiently, uh, or is a, is an idea for, uh, some other direction is, uh, speak up, uh, because, um, you know, I mean, the worst that can happen is speak up nicely. Yeah, criticism should be constructive. And the worst they can tell you is actually no. And sometimes they will explain to you why we can't do that. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a legal thing. Maybe uh, there are other constraints that you don't know about, but that all comes from uh, understanding your organization. Okay. Okay. What if I'm the junior person in the room on the team? What if I'm young? What if I'm female? What if I'm an introvert? What if I'm shy? I got some things to say, but I'm not. How do I go about um, broaching the subject then? Well, uh, if you're shy, um, one way is to just meet with one of the people one-on-one -on -one and say, uh, someone more experienced and say, well, I was thinking about that. 
uh, and what do you think? And they might say, yes, it's a great idea. You should bring it up at the next meeting. Or sometimes uh, you might uh, write an email um, to the boss and say, you know, I have been thinking about this and noticed that and, and, uh, and here is a suggestion. And people appreciate suggestions. So sometimes you have to explain, well, yes, it's a good suggestion, but we can't do it for whatever reasons. But then you learn more about the organization. And it's, um, I, I guess the, what you're illustrating is that a person can contribute, really, they can lead from any position they are in the hierarchy. Oh yeah. Yes. And, uh, you know, and in general, we, uh, we do reward. You know, people who are, and doesn't matter how young or new they are, but if they come up with good ideas, um, you know, we'll take them. Lesson number, an extension of that is lesson number eight, step up, be helpful to your coworkers and colleagues. Yes. And you have to balance that with knowing what is expected of you and the work that you really have to do. But if someone says, oh. Um, you know, I, I need you to be, let's say on the, the search committee, because we are searching for a new scientist or whatever, uh, don't think, oh, that's going to be so much work. Yes, it will be. But again, it's part of uh, being a, a team player in your organization. Sometimes you got to put uh, your other priorities aside and step up to something that your organization really needs, uh, it is rewarded because in any organization, yes, you know, people have to step up, you know, they can't just be in their back room, uh, uh doing their own work unless they are on some very specialized job <laughs> that uh, I have never been in. <laughs> and when we say step up, I guess what we're, it's an, it's an American phrase. What it means is initiate action, take the initiative to. And you know what it reminds me of is the Royal Australian, the Royal, the Royal Navy in, in England, um, they have trained their officers like this for ooh, about 400 years and they have, and they train, the train, they cultivate it very much to, for an officer to be bothered, that is to take action. And the example I remember in a book about this, you're the first one in the meeting room and there is ice water on the table. Pour everybody a glass before people get there because it saves time and it's a, it's a, it's a way to contribute. Look for act, look, actively seek positive ways to contribute all the bloody time. And that's what they teach yes, in the Royal yes. Navy. And I think that that's, re reminds me of what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Uh, lesson number nine. The other, th this is another lesson that should be carved in stone for people. A little self promotion is fine at work. Yes, as long as uh, you don't hog credit, you got to be able to tell your boss or bosses uh, that you are doing good work. Uh, and uh, and it's also a matter of keeping them informed uh, because, you know, I mean, I've been a manager and uh, I don't know what mm -hmm. all my people are doing. Uh, and uh, when I was a, a section manager and had like over 80 people, and, <laughs> I mean, I had some middle managers in between, but I, I couldn't know what everybody was doing. So sometimes if someone sent, uh, sent me an email and saying, well, you know, this project of mine got funded or, uh, you know, here is a, a, a new paper I had that actually, uh, got some publicity, you know, that that's good. That, that helps your managers, your bosses, you know, understand the good work that, uh, that you're doing. Yes. And that's what I would like people to know that the manager, the boss is grateful for that sort of news. If you capture the right tone in promoting exactly. yourself. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah. And, and it's more a matter of, um, that's why I said a little, it, it's more a matter of information rather than saying anti-grade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no one likes that. <laughs> No one, no country, no culture likes that. Look at me. Look at, look how valuable yeah. I am to the team. Yes. Right. Lesson number 10. Now, this is curious to me. I, I'd like, I do want you to discuss this. Lesson number 10, decide how you'd like to be remembered. Uh, yes. It's, uh, it, it, it's worth stopping to think now and then after all this work is done and you retire and disappear in the sunset or, or whatever. Uh, what is it that you're really leaving behind? 
And in fact, uh, that was actually um, perhaps my main motivation for pursuing uh, science, that I wanted to do something that was important, that I felt was important. And I thought space exploration was the most important thing that my generation was doing. And that's why I wanted to be part of it. New generation may feel uh, that there are other things that, um, uh, you know, they feel it's really important for the world, whether uh, you more, go more in the, you know, climate change area or medicine or whatever it is, but um, it's about looking at what you're doing and, uh, and asking yourself, can I leave the world uh, a little bit better than the way I found it? And that doesn't mean just, you know, your day-to-day -day work. I think one of the valuable things I have done is public outreach and encouraging students uh, to pursue careers in uh, science and technology. And maybe I'll be remembered more for that than for my actual papers and books, you know, and that's fine. But is always trying to keep that kind of big picture, maybe a bit of a philosophical big picture in mind mm -hmm. is how am I helping the world? How am I helping other people? So that's, that's really what I meant by that statement. I guess the way I hear that Rosalie is, is to urge people to stop thinking about your own sorry self and start thinking about how you can bring right. it to the bigger, the bigger picture, something of which most of us need to be reminded daily. <laughs> right, right. It's, it's not, uh, the world is not about you. <laughs> it's more about what you can do for the world. All right. Well, let me finish up with one question, unscheduled question. We've been talking about the things that you've learned in your life and in your career, but what have you unlearned? lately. And by that, I mean something that you knew to be absolutely true then, but now realize eh, that's not the case. Hmm. That's a, that's a tough one. You know, I can't think of something that, uh, you know, has so fundamentally changed, uh, that, uh, you know, I, I feel it's no longer important. Um, you know, maybe something I have unlearned is, um, but it goes back to one of my lessons. When you're young, especially, uh, you feel that if you are, let's say in a meeting and people start talking about something that you, uh, you know, you don't really understand, uh, that you feel inferior and insecure. And I have learned that uh, there will always be people, if you're with smart people, there will always be people who are talking about some aspect uh, <laughs> of the problem or of the mission or whatever that you uh, don't actually understand. And that's fine. And you can't know everything. Even in your own subject area is don't be too hard on yourself. Uh, we tend to be sometimes our worst critics. And also that, you know, maybe something that, um, I thought that was really, you know, major in my younger days. I thought that, uh, you know, the guy who got the highest grades or the girl who seemed to be the smartest was the person who was going to become the most successful. And that didn't actually happen. The people who became uh, the most successful were the people who had drive, persistence, and who could work with others, who had um, pleasant personalities, who could actually work with other people. Success is um, it, it's not just about uh, being the smartest or uh, being the one who gets the highest grades, who is the best technically in a subject. It is about uh, how much drive and persistence you have uh, that, you know, even when um, uh, you have setbacks, uh, you can carry on and not give up. Uh, and it is about being able to work with others and, and being a nice person. So, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, those are the things that matter the most. Well, you combine those three things and you make a contribution to the world. And that's a pretty good career. That's a pretty good life. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay. We will close on that note. Our guest today has been Dr. Rosalie Lopez of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. You've been listening to us and we would like to hear from you. You can email us the podcast. Email is podcast at 10lessonslearn.com. That's podcast at 10, the number one, zero, lessonslearn.com. 
Um, please let us know what you think of this episode. This episode has been produced by Robert Hosry and is sponsored, as always, by the Professional Development Forum. You can find them on professionaldevelopmentforum.org. And while you're emailing us, go ahead and hit that subscribe button because this is the only podcast on the internet that's making the world a wiser place lesson by lesson. Thanks for listening. And thank you, Rosalie, for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. <laughs>